I want to talk a little bit about the international dimensions of what's going on in the commons. I've been, uh, as Tom said, working on the commons for about the past 15 years, uh, first with On the Commons, and then the past two years with Commons Strategy Group, which is less of an organization than a, uh, a network of people. I work with uh, a woman named Silke Helfrich in Germany, who's been associated with the Green Party's Henry Bolt Foundation, which is a very active supporter of the, the Commons in Germany and actually internationally. And uh, Michelle Bowens, the Pure Cure Foundation, a Belgian man based in Thailand, an excellent website uh, for digital commons, uh, the Peer Peer Foundation. And um, what I'd like to do, I think that we can get a lot of inspiration and uh, education from studying some of the examples going on internationally. I, don't, I have uh, a broad knowledge, but by no means encyclopedic, so what I'm about to present will be partial. There are many other things going on, but. Uh, I've not been involved in, but I can tell you a lot about uh, Europe, India, the global south, and some of the examples going on there. And th despite the highly diverse context of history, economics, politics, they all gravitate towards the commons uh, because they see certain core things. And I think what those consist of are one way to assert the integrity of their community and their control over resources that they believe they own and share, ought to own and share, and they're trying to assert that. Uh, it's, it's a way of asserting moral relationships to those resources. It's like saying, that lake, that software, that urban space belongs to me and my fellow citizens, my fellow commoners. And so, simply to use the word is to start to reorient the discussion. And I, I would stress that a lot of this, a lot of the commons is about adopting the language and the identity of commoners because it, it starts to itself deconstruct the prevailing culture and start to reconstruct an alternative one based on different values, different, uh, different core uh, terminologies, different epistemology, you might say. So it's, it's a, the language is a way to help establishing this alternative worldview, ethic, set of social practices. Um, the Commons also, in all these contexts, serves as a really powerful critique of neoliberal capitalism, but it's more than that. It's a basis for workable alternatives uh, that, that can evolve, that commoners control themselves. So it has a proactive and construct, constructive dimension as well as a critical one. Uh, and as I say, it's not just a policy critique. It's not just uh, about um, a political philosophy. It's a worldview. It's a um, moral and social ethic. Uh, it, it cuts very deep, I've found. Now, a lot of what's driving this are enclosures of the commons, and we've, we've heard a number of them tonight, uh, because the enclosures start to highlight what's being taken away from us and what no longer exists. Uh, you know, the capitalism calls it progress, and oftentimes we don't have a word for what is in fact enclosure. Progress is often a matter of enclosure because it's commodifying, privatizing something that we want shared, and then dubbing it progress, uh, economic development. And so the language of the commons is a way to start to challenge that and to assert uh, a certain egalitarian ethic, a co-production and co-governance ethic, which is uh, too often missing uh, in controlling the uh, Enclosures. We heard about Bolivia. The international land grab is a major uh, driver of Bolivia. There is now an unprecedented uh, amount of purchasing of arable farmland, uh, pasture land, lands treated as historic commons by indigenous peoples or other uh, communities, which you know China and Saudi Arabia and India have it, uh, both sovereign funds and investment uh, vehicles in which they're gobbling up massive amounts of Africa and Latin America uh, and essentially displacing people. And it's like a modern day replication of the English enclosures where people were displaced from their villages and forced to uh, move into the city and become essentially Dickinson, uh, Charles Dickens type wage slaves. This is happening right now as countries position themselves to uh, secure arable land. India is an interesting case because a lot of this is happening, yet because so much of the economy uh, is also pastoral and based on livestock, there's been a pushback. And so in places like Rajasthan, we actually have the government establishing uh, commons-based policies 
to protect Congress. And in fact, uh, last year there was a major Supreme Court case where the Indian Supreme Court uh, prohibited an enclosure of a village, a village pond and forced the people who had built some real estate development on top of it uh, to, to move. And that ostensibly is the legal precedent in India now. Uh, it was it's properly seen as a, as a major landmark. And I'm quite curious to see how India develops this between its capitalist narrative as this fierce tiger of capitalist development and the genuine pushback by millions of people who say, no, these are commons. Uh, a group there that's really leading this is the Foundation for Ecological Security, uh, trying to push commons-friendly policies. Um, there's also a lot of, some, we were talking earlier about seed sharing. Seed sharing is a major way to, to combat uh, Monsanto. Perhaps some of you know of the, of the incredible number of farmer suicides that have occurred as GMOs and other first world agriculture methods have been uh, imposed upon farmers, leading to them, of course, uh, not being able to earn enough money. And so seed sharing is one way for them to come back and reclaim their agricultural commons, their, their local uh, native varieties of foods, instead of doing monoculture uh, GMO type crops. Um, it's, it's also interesting, I might add, how this replicates the John Locke notion of uh, when, of course, the Europeans came to America, that this, these were wastelands. And because they're wastelands and they're not developed, uh, we can take them. They're, they're valueless. And that's precisely the, the claims that are made in India these days, that these are wastelands. And the point is that just because people are living in ecologically sustainable ways with their land doesn't mean it's undeveloped or without value. But it, it, it helps to sort of tease out these uh, frameworks of what is value. Uh, the commons asserts a different mode of value. Uh, I was at a conference in the Balkans um, last year, and the major issue there are enclosures of coastal lands and urban spaces in which government officials are essentially colluding with uh, real estate developers to give away the common lands. So there's a, a, a huge uh, awareness in Macedonia, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, of, of uh, enclosures and uh, corresponding efforts to defend the commons. The Green, the Green Party, again, is quite active there. I mentioned Germany. Uh, it's remarkable how mainstream the commons is in German political discourse. Uh, the Green Party is one of the key instigators of this, but uh, another interesting element there is the Pirate Party, which some of you may or may not have heard of. It originated in Sweden as a, a way to deal with copyright and internet issues, and it has since gone international. There are now several dozen uh, Pirate Party in formation or actually working. In Germany, they won, um, uh, in, in uh, Berlin, the municipal elections won 10% of the, of the vote and have several people uh, in government. There are now two Swedish uh, Pirate Party people in the European Parliament. So who knows how far this is going to go. There's some issues in terms of how they expand their agenda, how they engage with legitimate, quote, legitimate politics coming from the outside. But they share many issues with commoners and Occupy in saying that the existing system is rigged, doesn't work, needs to be changed. So there's some interesting lessons we might learn from the Pirate Party uh, as it tries to break through and with the Green Party as it tries to uh, mainstream the issue of the commons within Germany. Uh, there was a major international uh, conference, international commons conference in Berlin almost two years ago, uh, in November 2010. If you Google those words, you can find a, a website with a lot of videos and, and other valuable resources. It brought 200 self-identified commoners from about 35 countries to Berlin. Uh, for the first ever such gathering of those people. Uh, and uh, we're trying to build on that energy. There's going to be a conference in May 2013 on the economics of the, com of the commons, also in Berlin, hosted by the uh, Bull Foundation. And we're currently uh, trying to plan that. We, we want to both sort of deal with the traditional economic approaches, but understand at a more profound level the socio-political economic dimensions of commons both digital commons, where the resource is not completable, 
as well as natural resource commons, which you know are depletable and, as economists say, are rivalrous, meaning one person can't use it if the other is using it. Um, but what, what I, for me, it, it was, it's hard to sort of communicate how that conference was so important. But by having in the flesh hackers from Amsterdam, uh, Filipino farmers, uh, squatter community people from South Africa, the Minister of Digital Culture from Brazil, uh, many uh, academics and activists from the U.S. It was, and then to see how all of them had a um, affinity for each other and this, this spirit of conversation, it really made palpable the solidarity that I think, I think is trying to uh, assert itself. Uh, through the, the medium of the commons as a, as a language. Because, of course, the cultural, political, historical, language issues divide us immensely. Yet, uh, at this conference, there was an enormous uh, sense of wanting to come together, wanting to learn from each other, realize that we had shared, uh, shared values and shared uh, problems that we were confronting. Um, but another sign of Germany being quite advanced in this, there recently was founded a new research institute on, on climate change and global commons. That was the name. So uh, the fact that they can sort of utter those words and be seriously committed to that agenda, I find very impressive. France has a lot of interest in the commons. Uh, traditionally, however, a lot of left of center politics there has focused on the government change or socialism as opposed to self-organized commons. So there's some cultural um, issues there in trying to get wrap their minds around the commons. I think it's more developed among uh, internet-oriented commons there. Uh, I learned a very important uh, etymology of the commons by Frenchman Alain, Alain Lapitz, who said that the commons really originate not so much from England, but from the Norman language. And he did the etymology for me once and said that the, the word came from two uh, Norman words for gift and duty. And I thought that was just a beautiful uh, sum, a sort of two-word summary of how commons function. They are gifts to all of us, and we get duties in return. And it, it sort of captured, I think, a, a nice spirit of the commons. Italy, in the past year or two, has just erupted with all sorts of commons-based activities. A few, I think it was actually it was two years ago, there was a major voter referendum nationwide on whether to privatize the municipal, the municipal water system and water resources or not. And the establishment and the media were totally shocked when 94% of the voters rejected it. And the word commons was the, the word used in this initiative. So. There, too, in Italy, there is enormous recognition of the commons, qua commons. Uh, the mayor of Naples is an incredibly uh, aggressive promoter of the commons. He, just two weeks ago, had a conference for municipal uh, Italian municipal officials and mayors on municipal commons. He's appointed an assessor of the commons for Naples. And he's behind a, an effort uh, to uh, have a European-wide voter initiative to establish, it's called a European um, European Charter of the Commons, in which under a, the Lisbon Treaty, which I'm not really familiar with, they can propose, if they get a million signatures from people through enough countries in Europe, to have a Europe-wide uh, uh, referendum on that and uh, have, have the European Parliament make law on those issues. They're having Sorry, certain problems. I just put some of those documents down there. Oh, Somebody did you? In English, they, they said that the English is not very good, but I put some of them there if somebody wants to grab. Great. That's what you're mentioning. It's unclear where that's going to go because, in some ways, this charter aspires to be like a constitutional thing, and the voter initiative process really doesn't allow for something constitutional. It's more specific legislation. So they have to work out, I think, some legal issues in this. But nonetheless, there was a major conference in Rome just this past weekend uh, to discuss this issue, to work out language, to organize, and so forth. So there's just uh, some incredible energy there. I'll just read a, a sentence or two from this uh, charter to give you a, a flavor of it. The vision. The commons must be rediscovered and fully appreciated as collective goods or services to which access is necessary for a balanced fulfillment of the fundamental 
of needs of all of the people. Um, it is necessary that the commons are understood not only as living resources such as forest, biodiversity, water, glaciers, seabeds, etc., but also organized public services such as schools, healthcare facilities, and transportation. And it goes on like that. So, they, in other words, it's kind of this full body um, vision with specific provisions that they hope to change the dialogue within Europe through that process. I'm, I'm quite, active, quite curious to see how this evolves, but they do have a lot of support. We talked uh, earlier a little bit about Rio Plus 20. I totally agree the conference is not going to uh, yield anything meaningful, but there is a, an alternative people summit uh, with the World Social Forum uh, heavily involved in that. About two or three weeks ago, there was a major meeting in Porto Alegre, Brazil, of many uh, NGOs and other uh, environmentally oriented people. My colleague Silke Helfrich was there, uh, and she had some success in getting the group to uh, understand the strategic value of talking about the commons in the run-up to Rio Plus 20. Unclear how much some NGOs or others are going to actually embrace that, but there was some genuine interest, and it may develop uh, people at least are entering Rio with that in mind. In fact, they, they prepared a two-page statement uh, summarizing their sensibility on this, which I put, oh, I should mention, my, which I put on my blog if you want to chase it down easily. Uh, my blog is www.bolier.org. My last name. Um, the other fascinating and encouraging thing is the Global South is starting to understand how the Commons can start to frame some of their concerns in confronting neoliberal capitalism and trade policy. They see it as a, from indigenous people to uh, Others trying to defend the traditional ways of life or community, you know, from Mexican farmers to uh, African pastoralists, they see how the commons can begin to, in a, well, as I mentioned earlier, this is about language, can begin to name and make real their value concerns in pushing back against the, the uh, neoliberal trade policy approach. Uh, and so there's some different pockets where this is more fully developed than others. Brazil. Uh, despite being um, maybe turned the, the other path on some of this, uh, they are a leader in free culture, free software, and digital commons. Uh, about five or eight years ago, under um, President Lula, he appointed the musician Gilberto Gil as his minister of culture. And he was a four-square ardent advocate for uh, free culture and uh, had government, uh, all government materials were issued under uh, Creative Commons licenses and they uh, brought the technology and free software to communities and favelas and villages. And so there's this real sensibility in uh, Brazil about free culture, in part because ethnically they're a remix culture themselves. So the whole creative sensibility is, is just a, a perfect fit. My, so my point is there are a lot of uh, pockets of interest there. Um, oh, I, I, I meant to say this about why the global south, south sees the commons as strategically value, valuable as an alternative framework for uh, challenging development. One, it's, it begins to address the compulsive uh, externalizing of cost that capitalism is involved in. It confronts the ethic of monetizing all value. It uh, deals with the growth imperatives of the economy, and it deals with the legal prejudices against collective stewardship of resources. It's hard to find in a lot of Western law ways to uh, ways to deal with uh, collective ownership and stewardship. Um, I should mention a project I'm involved with. I'm working with an international human rights professor, Burns Weston, on something called the Common Law Project, and we're trying to develop. Uh, recover from history these fragments of commons based law and show how they ought to be resurrected and given contemporary embodiment in, in legal standing as a way to empower state uh, sanctioning of, of commons and facilitating commons. The state's not going to wither away. We have to find some ways for the state to support the use and development of commons. Uh, I'll just quickly mention that the education about the commons is burgeoning. There's the School of Commoning in, in uh, the London the School of Commoning in London, which George Bohr will be talking about, I think, in one of the panels tomorrow. 
in Germany is there's a summer school in the Commons. I've helped uh, the UN Institute for Training and Research develop an online course on the Commons. It's going to be go live, I think, March 1st. Uh, that may slide a bit, but it's a four-module online course, self-paced, videos, readings, and so forth. Let me close by mentioning there's a huge number of what we might call transnational tribes of commoners. Uh, I'll just tick down my the list that I have. The Solidarity Economy Movement, the Transition Town Movement, Water Activists, the Landless Workers Movement, Via Campesino, Free Software, Open Source Software Movement, uh, Creative Commons Licenses, Licensing and free, the Free Culture World Remix, Mashups, the Wikipedia world, massive, dozens of languages, tens of thousands of people. Open access publishing, the open educational resources movement, uh, which are dedicated to making curricular books, everything available for free. I mentioned the Pirate Party, and I think we could add to this list the Occupy movement. And so there's kind of a convergence of movements. All, they don't necessarily speak the same language or the same culture, but they have many of the same values, which I think the commons helps express. And then there's many, many smaller examples that maybe uh, burst out more. I won't, don't have time to go through all of those, but many fascinating uh, discrete, discrete projects that uh, are developing. So as this suggests, the commons is a work in progress. It's unity without uniformity. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, I think a way of trying to recover some very elemental things, but it has to work its way through to find ways through institutions, new forms of law, uh, to manifest itself, and not just simply be a uh, about sharing and caring. It needs institutional forms. So I think our major challenge is uh, to, develop, to develop this mindset, to develop the vocabulary for uh, seeing the commons in the first place, and then collectively making it through our language, through our own distributed innovation, uh, and you know, not getting caught up in sectarian uh, squabbles when, in fact, there are so many more urgent and larger issues that unite us. Uh, while at the same time, of course, having these uh, robust dialogues of, of the kind we're having here tonight. So that's my brief tour of some of the more significant uh, issues on the commons. And uh, you know, let's just keep learning. Thank you.